Good evening, friends. Well, a very warm welcome to the History Society's uh, public lecture this year. Uh, we know this is a really busy time of the semester, so I think it's really gratifying for the History Society and for Dr. Rodkey and for all of us to see such a great turnout on, at, at this particular time. So thank you very much for coming uh, and uh, being part of the conversation. So I see, uh, I think I see everybody's already wearing a mask and we just wanna say thank you very much for doing that. Just knowing that we've got some uh, vulnerable people in the, in the group tonight, we wanted to offer that uh, kind of kindness and respect to them. So if you need a different mask or you need one at all, there are a few at the door if you miss them on the way in. You probably also saw on the way in that the History Society is drawing for a coveted History Society black hoodie. So if you didn't get a chance yet and you wanna enter your name in the draw, you too could be a fashion icon here uh, uh, around uh, the city of Moncton. So I know that many, if not all of you, have had Dr. Rogke as a, as a teacher, as a professor in your class. And so you know her from that way. But I'd like to introduce her tonight as Dr. Rodkey, the scholar and the lecturer. So if you'd just allow me to say a few things about her to uh, see a side of her that you may or may not always get to see uh, in the same way in the classroom. So Dr. Alyssa Rodkey, our lecturer tonight, was recently appointed to Associate Professor of Psychology and granted tenure here by the university and is the coordinator of the Department of Psychology. She holds a PhD from York University. She has published an impressive range of peer-reviewed research articles in journals such as the Journal of Genetic Psychology, the Journal of the History of the Behavioral Sciences, The Psychologist, and the Journal of Pain, among many others. And she's currently preparing her book for publication with the University Press uh, over this next couple of years. She was recently honored with, among others, an Early Career Award by the Society for the History of Psychology. But uh, all of those psychology credentials notwithstanding, we in the history department like to think of her as one of our own. So, uh, she was, after all, uh, trained in as a historian of psychology and has done extensive archival research in archival collections all around North America. In fact, one summer she took a road trip that covered, I think, half of the United States and hit archive after archive. It's a great research story. Um, and we love it when she comes into our classrooms to talk about her archival research and her approaches to material history and the fantastic love stories and history of science stories that she's found uh, in the archives. By training, and by her collaborative spirit, Dr. Rodkey models what it means to bridge the social sciences and the humanities. And as she did recently, just last week, uh, in a talk to faculty here at Crandall, about how it is that you can bridge uh, Christian faith and the discipline of psychology. She's a real inspiration to us in that area of integration. And so it's a real pleasure to welcome Dr. Rodkey to address us on the topic tonight, a wandering bird, psychologist Magda Arnold and intellectual communities open and closed. So Dr. Rodkey, would you come and would you please join me in welcoming her? Thanks so much for that kind introduction, uh, Dr. Grant. And Thank you to, to the History uh, Department, or History Society for the invitation. <clears throat> I don't know if it's a little loud. <laughs> um, all right, I wanna do something a little bit risky as a geriatric millennial and start, <laughs> start by invoking a movie trope. So, okay, yeah, I guess I have to set it up a little bit. Um, pop songs, plays, movies about to start, and then, don't, 
whole family now, tech. <laughs> oh, I unplugged the, uh, there we go. A record scratch. And then the protagonist of the movie says, yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I got here. Um, so imagine me saying that about this tweet uh, from last year. Oh, you know, just this normal Saturday night, listening to the Emma 2020 soundtrack and writing about how the Psychological Roundtable used to show porn at their meetings and had a brass gavel in the shape of a penis. <laughs> Yep. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, my work brings me to interesting places. And uh, the answer, strangely enough, to how did I get here is Magda Arnold. Um, or more specifically, studying the biographies of women in psychology. Um, in a recent paper, I wrote, a sense of deja vu is an occupational hazard to those who devote any significant time to the studying of women in psychology women in the history of psychology. Um, and I went on to talk about there's, there's this sort of curious sameness that um, you start to feel as you read these stories because they kind of, they start to sound really similar. And it's not that the women are similar because they're all being, they're all very different and they're all being very creative in the ways that they respond uh, to career challenges. Um, but it's the barriers that are the same. And so, um, I've, although I sort of started off doing my dissertation on Meg to Arnold with the more biographical focus, where I really kind of was looking at her life, and specifically I was interested in um, looking at the way her conversion to Catholicism affected uh, her, her um, ideas and her career. Um, I've gone on, to, since I've um, defended my dissertation, I've gone on to publish a couple things that are more about the systemic nature. Oh, <laughs> I guess I could have uh, triggered that remotely here. Uh, let's skip that. Uh, on to, I've gone on to publish, um, in specific, these two papers uh, that I think uh, start to capture some of these systems at work. Um, and these are both published um, in collaboration with my sister, uh, who is sort of my intellectual community, speaking of intellectual community. Um, and so on, in this paper, I'm going to be drawing on two major concepts um, from this, uh, these works. Um, one, intellectual community. Um, and this is basically the idea, um, in this paper we argue, that intellectual community, that is to say, having an audience to listen to your ideas and give you feedback on it and, and have kind of an informed critique is actually a really necessary resource for uh, scientists. Um, but that this resource is often denied marginalized uh, scientists um, who are often, often women. Um, and so they have to uh, create, although there are official intellectual communities like in the university, if they are barred from those areas, um, or, you know, secret societies that love to show porn, for example, they have to create uh, unofficial spaces, unofficial communities to compensate for that. And then um, my second paper focused on um, power uh, in, uh, and gender in psychology. And um, the part of this paper that I'll focus on is, is these all-male spaces in psychology. Um, power basically allows for the structuring of the discipline. Um, and often this was done according to gender. Um, so I will focus on these elite all-male spaces um, to demonstrate how this kind of worked. So hopefully you can sort of, I'll kind of try to wrap things up at the end, but hopefully you can see these ideas unfold as I give you more sort of biographical information about Magda Arnold. Um, Arnold is a psychologist who's now best remembered for her pioneering emotion theory. Um, and if she's not remembered for that, she's remembered for her Catholic faith because she was very open about this. Um, as you can see from her dates here, her life spanned the 20th century. So she's almost born exactly on the beginning and end of the century. Um, so it's very handy for figuring out how old she was for any given event. And she was most active in psychology in the 50s and 60s. So let me tell you a little fairy, fairy tale. Once upon a time, there was a little girl who was born in a small town 
in Europe, and nobody wanted her. Um, Magda was born uh, in what was now Austria, but now the Czech Republic. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, I marked it there on the map. Um, and just in case you're wondering, Prague is like way the heck the other side of, of the Czech Republic. Um, and yeah, it was a very small German speaking town. And the reason nobody wanted her was that she was the Ill illegitimate child of two opera singers. Um, I don't have any, I don't have a picture of her uh, father, but um, aren't these magnificent of her mother, the opera singer. And she says her earliest memory is of a stern looking woman scolding me, um, and that was her mother. But she actually didn't see that much of her mother um, because her mother was an opera singer. I don't quite know the details of this arrangement, but she basically arranged for um, Meg to, to be raised by two of her female admirers. Um, so here's Magda with her sort of adopted auntie who raised her. Um, and um, although this sounds like it could be nice, um, it was not. Uh, the the uh, aunt was harsh and somewhat neglectful. Um, Magda's mom didn't really always pay child support as she had promised, so they were very poor, and they sometimes took it out on, on young Magda. Um, so she spent a lot of time kind of playing alone. Um, she, re she recalls that she, uh, at one point, an uncle visited, and he was kind of shocked the degree to which she was just allowed to kind of wander the woods by herself as long as she was back in time for, for dinners. And in fact, she saw her mom so infrequently that it wasn't until she was 19 that she learned that she actually had a half brother. Um, she was just on a visit to, like, she went to visit her mom for Christmas, and the mom was like, "Surprise! You have a half brother," um, which, uh, yeah, was a bit of a shock. But they really liked each other, and she was a really bright girl. Um, she enjoyed school. Really voracious reader. She basically read everything in the local library and borrowed books from a wealthy family. Um, but her aunts were very unsupportive of this. Um, in fact, one of the aunts threatened, I guess constantly threatened to throw her books in the fire. Um, and you know, she just kind of, they thought, they saw, thought she was very odd, um, had all these ideas that was so troublesome. Um, so here's an account from her uh, her autobiography about this time. She says, this, these years of growing up were very difficult for me. I had no support at home, was painfully shy, and well aware of being an unattractive shrimp with freckles, a nose that was far too big, and an imbalance of the eye muscles that made one eye stray whenever I was not focusing proper, properly. And then about her illegitimate birth, which was, of course, a big deal at the time. Uh, she says, I was under a cloud, you know, from the day I was born. So her first real positive note from her childhood, and in fact, her first experience of intellectual community um, was this German youth group called the Wandervogel, which actually means wandering bird, which kind of inspired my, uh, my title for this evening. Um, so this was basically a German arts and culture youth group. Um, and they would go, part of the wandering bird thing is that they would go for these long nature rambles. And um, they would, yeah, kind of revived some German culture music and um, stuff like that. And um, these, if this seems vaguely familiar, Hitler would go on to um, co-opt these kind of German youth, youth groups um, into the Hitler youth. Um, so uh, that wasn't their origin, but then later on they kind of were melded into that. Um, and Magda just absolutely loved this group. Um, it really felt at home. She loved the fact that they would explore ideas and kind of argue about things. Um, and yeah, really enjoyed that. And it was as a teen that she was first exposed to psychology. Um, she says, I first read Freud's Psychopathology of Everyday Life at the age of 16. I wanted to be a psychologist. There was not the faintest chance I knew that. And this was because um, she was not tracked into the academic route in, um, in high school. 
So um, she would have needed to do that in order to go into university. And also because the family was very poor, so there wasn't any money for that. Um, and so once she graduated from high school, uh, she started um, she started work. I'm just gonna unplug this so we don't have a background buzz the whole time. Um, now, if I were to do a second uh, musical thing, which obviously <laughs> it's probably good I didn't, I would have to cue some threatening villain music for the next slide. Um, so this is Robert Arnold, uh, Bertel. Um, he even has a mustache to you know look very villainous. Um, so he was a member of Wander Vogel. She met there. And uh, she was, he was also Megda's rebound. So in other words, she was in love with someone else. That person got another person pregnant. Um, and so even though she said of this first love, uh, Richard, my thoughts returned to him like homing birds, um, she decided to settle for uh, Bertel. Um, because she thought, well, it's not the same, but it is a quieter type of love, um, so maybe that's okay. So they got married um, in 1926 when she was 22 and moved to Prague, so moved to the big city. And she's now Meg to Arnold. Now, Bertel, uh, for his other flaws, was right about one thing, which was that there was going to be another war. So he had been the age that was just about um, being called up for um, being in the military with the First World War, and he was like, I want none of that. We need to get out of Europe. Um, and so they decided to immigrate to Canada. Um, and so, uh, yeah, Toronto. I think, actually, she probably came through Moncton on the train because she arrived by boat in Halifax and then, uh, and then went, you know, on the way to Toronto, so probably came right through here. Um, unfortunately, Megda wasn't very impressed by Toronto. She thought it was very provincial. Um, she'd heard it was the best lit city in North America, and she's like, if this is the best lit city, what is the rest of this place like? This is crazy. Um, and so they settled in kind of having this immigrant experience of you know, trying to find work in a new country. Um, and luckily, um, Bertel was able to get work at University of Toronto as a German teacher. Um, and they had their first uh, child together. And then a couple years after that, um, a second child um, and a couple years after that, a third child. Now, I don't have a picture of uh, the third child, and there's a reason for that. Um, more ominous music. There started being problems in the marriage. Uh, so, for example, they went back to Europe to visit family. Well, Magda was pregnant with daughter number two, Catherine, or sorry, Margaret, and... Um, she actually ran into some health complications and had to be hospitalized. Meanwhile, Bertel abandoned her to go sightseeing. So she was like life-threatening in the hospital. He's like, see ya, I'm gonna go hiking. Um, then on the boat home when they had uh, the second baby, um, and so she had a toddler and a new baby, Bertel often like left her alone for hours to go flirt with uh, another woman who was on the, on the ship. He also blamed her for not dressing more fashionably and sort of, you know, not bouncing back after, you know, ba giving birth, I guess. Um, and she really wanted to go to university. Um, and she would have been able to because he worked at U of T, so like tuition break for, for employee family. But he said, no, you would be being a bad mother if you did that. Um, so in June 1935, things come to a head. Um, their daughter, Catherine, is born, the, the third uh, child. The evening that Magda comes home from the hospital, um, Bertel says, you know what? I'm really tired of being married. I don't feel married, and I'm not going to act married. So um, I'm basically going to play the field. I'm going to start bringing women home. You can still stay home and keep house. Um, that's fine, but you know, don't expect this to be a marriage. That's not going to be a thing. So Magda Arnold, obviously crushed, but says, no, you know, that doesn't sound like a great plan to me. Um, how about you pay for me to go to university instead? Um, so she manages to uh, convince him that she can go off to university, even though um, she's just had this, this baby and um, 
you know, because she's been lo longing to go to university and study psychology her whole life. Now, um, divorce is it isn't really possible at this point, or it's very difficult to, to get. And so custody defaults to the husband in the marriage. Um, so although Magda initially lived with um, her daughters while they were at school, eventually Bertle moved the girls out into Scarborough, which was really the countryside at the time. Um, the girls were ages nine, seven, and four. And so after that point, um, Magda only saw them occasionally. Uh, she didn't live with her kids, which is obviously really painful for Magda and traumatizing for her children. Um, but she didn't really feel like she had a choice. She says, this is in a letter to her daughter. She says, what, is, what were my alternatives? I know it was hard on all of you, but I know it would have been worse if I stayed because Robert would have used you to fight me every step of the way. This way, at least, he knew he got you to him, all to himself and could at least at times be a reasonably good father. Meanwhile, um, Magda is thriving at university. She does her BA, master's, and PhD in very quick succession. Um, just loves psychology, reads everything there is in psychology, um, and uh, gets a job teaching psychology at U of T while uh, the men are away um, on World War II. Um, you know, uh, but that's not a very permanent solution um, because, she, as she says, I was an immigrant, a woman, and worst of all, I was separated from my husband, who was a professor at the university. So she knows, like, I just don't have any career prospects here. So when she's offered a job in the U.S., she jumps at it. While in the U.S., she attends a psychology conference. And I have to emphasize, this is just a regular psychology conference. It's not a religious psychology conference. Um, but she's so excited by the ideas of psychology that she has this kind of crazy experience in the hotel room after. She says, I had a thoroughly good time and was tired and content when I went back to my hotel room. Not surprisingly, sleep did not come easily. I was too full of all I had seen and heard, enthusiastic about everything psychological. Eventually, I did fall asleep. But after some time, I woke again and became aware of a great calm. One by one, all the Catholic doctrines, most of them discarded long ago, now appeared in the light of reality. This is the way it is, necessary and undeniable. The Trinity, the virgin birth, Christ's sacrifice on the cross, all that and much more became clear and real beyond all doubt. I stayed awake the rest of the night thinking. I knew this experience was bound to change my life. Now I had a firm basis, a firm belief. So this is kind of the really key moment of her life. And indeed, it does change the trajectory that she's on. But before I could tell you about that, I want to say a word about sources. Because um, I know a bunch of you guys are in history courses and have a historical interest. Um, so I'll just tell you a little bit about how I came to have all these rich sources that I'm sharing with you. Um, I started off um, reading kind of what was published about her, of course. And then um, I went to uh, the University of Akron that has a history of psychology collection. And they have a Magda Arnold collection. So a bunch of papers from her are there. So I went and looked at them. And there's some of the things that I kind of found there, um, or the types of things that I found there. Um, some unpublished talks, that kind of thing. Then there's also um, an oral history interview with her. So somebody, while she was still alive, actually sat down with her and asked her about her life. Now, it's not the best, because he wasn't actually that interested in her, um, but it was, he was more interested in the history of Canadian psychology. But still, there's some interesting uh, things in that interview. I still had a lot of questions, though. One, well, what exactly this convert conversion experience? like? you know, more detail needed here. Also, there's this priest friend, John Gaston, that keeps popping up. So what's the deal with them? Um, and yeah, all these ideas, how did she come up with them? So um, a very kind Arnold researcher, who's kind of done with her, her projects on this, um, put me in touch with Joan Arnold, Magda's oldest daughter, who is still alive um, and in her 80s. And um, I was planning to go uh, fly to Arizona to interview Joan Arnold to do a oral history interview. And I was like, I don't even know if this is worth it, but it's true that like I've 
she probably does know a lot of interesting things because um, I know that she spent a lot of time with her mom in that kind of conversion period um, and, and as an adult. So she probably does have some interesting stories. While I was preparing for this trip, um, I was chatting with Joan on the phone and she mentioned that she thought she had a few letters between Magda and her priest friend and that she could pull a couple out and photocopy them for me. And I was like, oh my gosh, don't touch them. <laughs> I want all of them and I'm coming, you know, don't, don't touch them. And so a few letters turned out to be um, almost, more than 100 letters um, between uh, 1948 and 1956. And nobody who studied um, Meg Arnold before this knew about these letters. And actually, Joan didn't even know what was in a lot of these uh, things herself. Um, so it really was thrilling. Um, and it documents all those things that I was wondering about. Her conversion, uh, because her conversion happened in 1948, so there's actually discussion of that. Uh, her relationship with Gasson, obviously, they're back and forth. And uh, the development of her ideas, because that's a lot of what they're talking about. Um, and in addition to these letters, there were also two unpublished autobiographical accounts um, that this is where I'm getting a lot of information about her childhood. Uh, a bunch of other sorted papers and pictures. And these, these letters are just so beautiful. Um, I don't know if you guys nerd out about these things, but they're still in their 19, you know, 40s and 50s envelopes. And um, yeah, basically, Joan very sweetly let me uh, take them to the local Kinko's and photocopy them. Um, and I'm like trying to unfold them without like breaking them. And uh, they're mostly uh, Arnold, or sorry, the John Gasson to Meg to Arnold direction. There are a couple that are her to him, but they're mostly his letters. So there's something that she kept. Um, and so I left with my suitcase bulging of, with photocopies dazed with my good luck and wondering how I could possibly process them in time to include them in my dissertation, which was I was supposed to like finish pretty shortly after that. So, you know, if you ever are um, wanting to be kind to future historians, um, I have a couple tips. Please date your letters. This one's a typical one where he just dates it Saturday. Um, <laughs> And, and, and photos will be very handy if you put dates and names on your photos. Um, please write on easily photocopyable paper, not really thin stuff that when you photocopy it, the other side bleeds through. Um, please type and don't write. And please, if you know, if it's not too much trouble, um, please explain any inside references so that it's really easy to interpret. Um, so um, these are just lovely, actually. Um, you know, John Gasson is just a really kind of beautiful human being and like semi in love with him after reading all the, the, his side of the correspondence. But it's not just letters, there's some artifacts. So these are little prayer medallions um, that were in the correspondence, obviously had um, that shared religious belief. And then um, a whole bunch of um, Christmas cards with like really personal um, messages. That pamphlet that says Away with Mary uh, is a, um, a pamphlet that he sent to her um, as she was considering converting back to Catholicism. Um, so uh, yeah, who was this guy? Well, he was actually a student in one of her summer school classes at Harvard um, and you know, I think he was really critical in her conversion experience happening the way it did. I think in general she came back to faith, but he's the one that kind of made it so that she returned to Catholicism. Um, he introduced her to uh, the ideas of Aquinas, um, which matched kind of where she was going with her psychological theorizing, but she hadn't been exposed to it. becomes important. Um, so we see this um, conversation in their letters. So she, in their early, before she's returned to the church, she says, you know, I just plod along the only road left open, not knowing whether I'm going forward or back, nor at times knowing whether I'm on the right trail at all. And he says, do you know, my child, where you want to go? Could it be that you're going away from something and not towards something? Um, and so as a result of this conversation, he puts her in 
touch with a priest in her area, and she does decide to return to the Catholic Church. Um, and so he is just thrilled. This is from his letter uh, congratulating on her on uh, returning to the church. So the Latin translates, you are God, we praise you. You are the Lord, we acclaim you. Um, and he's just you know, bubbling over with delight for her. So she's now teaching at Bryn Mawr College. Um, and she's um, being able to find other Catholics um, in the in other Catholic communities. She actually, she's so zealous in her conversion that she actually considers becoming a nun at this point. Um, but Gasson tells her like, cool it, cool it. You're just like your brand new baby convert here. Let's, uh, let's hold off for a second. Um, but she says about this, I find myself suddenly among the most generous of friends wherever there are Catholics. Um, however, she's starting to feel out of place in the secular school. Um, so Bryn Mawr is a, a girls college, but it doesn't have any sort of religious background. And so she feels like the, the conversion has had this effect on her that it's made her a bad fit with uh, Bryn Mawr. And she thinks maybe I should go teach at a Catholic college instead. However, she really has to decide at this point whether she wants to be public about her faith. Um, she, uh, there's quite a stigma at this time period of being Catholic, and so um, she really is closing the door to other options. Um, so she makes this decision. Um, this is a letter she writes about this decision. Um, although, of course, from a worldly or even strictly professional point of view, it's the wrong kind of change to make. I've decided to do it. To do so, it's become quite clear to me that I just don't fit into the deliberately secular tradition of Bryn Mawr. Although I'm sorry to leave the East, and I don't like Chicago, I'm happy, to, I'm happy at the thought that next year I will be able to teach psychology the way I think it should be taught, so that the study of man will include man's purpose, both proximate and ultimate. So she's, she's wanting to bring faith into the way she teaches. She's also concerned about her daughter, uh, Joan. So Joan is also converted, also wants to become a nun, but wants to join a French-speaking order of nuns and doesn't speak any French. So she's like, she should come to this Catholic college and um, they'll get her a better fit for being a, being a nun. So that's a great plan on paper, um, but it turns out to be a real disappointment. Um, she takes a pay cut to go to this new school. Um, she finds that the students are very are weak academically and very passive, um, and that the administration doesn't really uh, care about improving the standards. And to top it all off, she is living in uh, stuck living on campus in a tiny little uh, four by ten room that opens onto two classrooms. So that's not this is just the library, but you know you can kind of imagine that. Um, and so this is this is Gasson's in, encouragement to her in that time period. He says, don't tell me you're living in a room four by 10, but let your cubby hole be a parable. Out of a close came a, a kind of home, so out of an empty sea can come not only a sign, but even a ship. And he really, um, he really encourages her in her uh, vocation as a teacher. Um, he says, you know, this is important even if your students aren't very good. Um, and uh, I really like this line. For you are teaching now first because you love God and God loves you. Eventually, though, she decides, I really got to get out of here. And um, she switches to uh, a Catholic school that has a lot better uh, students and research capacity. Now, one good thing does come out of her being at Barrett. She's able to um, bring her faith and scholarship together. Um, so here's a kind of a quote about what her vision for this is. She says, today as perhaps never before in this country, we Catholics have a chance of convincing people that true religion and true science are not enemies, but need one another to bring rich fruit. Um, so yeah, she's allowed to bring her faith and scholarship together. And um, together she and uh, Gasson host a conference with a bunch of other Catholic psychologists. And out of that conference comes this book, The Human Person. Um, and this puts, uh, which they call their baby, um, which puts forth a humanistic Catholic view of psychology. 
Um, so there's a lot more I could say about this, but I'll just give you a little taste of what kind of things uh, their perspective is um, from the correspondence, so which is of course where all the juicy bits are. Um, so she says, this is her take on Freud. She's not really a fan. Freudian analysis records a person's preoccupations, traces them back in memory, and rebuilds his emotional life in accord with moral precepts. Precepts. If the analyst is a Catholic, if not in accord with expediency, so whatever is kind of convenient. If there were a good psychiatrist I could recommend so-and-so to, I would feel a lot better about it. The trouble is, by now, I don't trust a Jungian anymore unless he's a Catholic, nor do I quite tr trust even a Catholic if he's Freudian. Um, so she basically thinks that there's certain ways of doing psychology that are at odds with uh, the ca Catholic teaching. Um, and what she's trying to do here with bringing faith and psychology together is pretty radical, even now, but especially for the time. Um, it's definitely a good way to get kicked out of the cool kids club in psychology. Um, this is a quote from her time in grad school. She says, I, I once said to Dr. Lyon that we might have to reintroduce the soul into psychology. He shocked, for goodness, Kate, goodness sakes, keep that under your hat. Um, there are these taboo categories uh, that uh, you don't want to touch um, in psychology at the time. So writing this book where she kind of really outs herself as a Catholic is a pretty gutsy move. Um, she goes on to um, write slightly, be slightly more careful in the way that she does um, her book on emotions. Uh, it's still from this Catholic perspective, but she's not as open about it. Um, now, s emotions at the time were really kind of neglected. Um, this is kind of the behaviorist take on emotions. The fear, rage, and love um, are the sort of basic emotions, and then you build from that. Um, but in general, emotions are really re neglected as a topic within psychology. Um, and if you do talk about them, you may basically only talk about the negative emotions. Um, and so, uh, she, although she doesn't openly reveal her faith in her book on emotions, it is very clearly there if you know where to look. Um, so um, these are two tables from my dissertation, so I don't expect you to actually read them. I can just tell you uh, that one of these is Meg Arnold's system of emotions, and one of these is Aquinas's, and they're pretty much the same. Um, like, really are exactly the same. She doesn't really credit Aquinas. I mean, you can rip off older dead people <laughs> um, like that. Um, and uh, But yeah, she's really still kind of being risky, uh, kind of pushing uh, psychology. Um, her main sort of argument here is that emotions are not just physiological drives. Um, in other words, humans are not like rats or robots, um, but they're humans act for reasons that aren't just these physiological things. So, you know, we might, a person might be decide to become a painter or a poet, even if that's not a behavior that's been reinforced. So I want to go back to uh, Gasson, seen here as at his most cherubic. Um, so he trains aspiring priests. Um, He's, uh, according to his students, absolutely deadpan, but hilarious. Um, and this really comes across in his letters. He loves comics, beer, baseball. Um, is from a large Lithuanian immigrant family and joined the Jesuits at 16. Um, and he, the letters really reveal that he is Arnold's intellectual community. They're, having, they're hashing out all her ideas together. And really, for a lot of his work, he could be her work, he could be a co-author. Um, so here are quotes from the two of them sort of giving uh, their own take on that. Um, so Arnold says, he was always ready to help me untangle the snags that inevitably turned up in working out my theory and writing my books. Gasson, stick with me, kid, and you'll always have a head to beat knots on. Um, but this really goes beyond just that. He does pr editing, proofreading, uh, work he even puts together her index of a book at one point. And seen from the outside, 
They just look like professional collaborators. Um, but what these letters reveal, and, and these photographs um, that Joan also shared with me, um, is that uh, they reveal that shortly after her conversion experience, Magda went to visit Spring Hill College to see John's, John at his school for the first time. And that's a pretty big trip. She's in Chicago, he's in uh, Mobile, Alabama. Um, and this trip is important spiritually. Um, this, she actually mentions how meaningful it was to her to take, to have mass in this little chapel on the, the campus. And then after she's um, visited the campus, she actually goes to New Orleans and goes to um, a, a convent and does a Catholic retreat there. And this is um, a, a convent that uh, John has recommended to her and has connections at. Um, and you can, we can also see that she finds the campus really beautiful. Um, you know, that she loves the azaleas in spring, but pretty sure this was the real attraction. Um, so um, in fact, uh, she comes together, uh, uh, this begins a pattern of visiting where she comes to visit him at least annually um, for the next 20 years. Um, they keep trying to meet elsewhere. Actually, I found a really cool photo that um, he made worth all the time that I kind of spent staring at slides to scan them. But I think we actually have shadows of John and Magda together on the um, Spring Hill campus captured there in one of her slides. So you might be wondering, well, what was their relationship? Um, she was a divorced woman. He was a Jesuit priest. Um, they were very clearly emotionally close. So we might have reasons to suspect a sexual relationship. We know from Joan that Magda definitely felt like romantically attracted to John. And as for him, here are some quotes from his letters. Uh, dear heart, may the Lord be sweet when he comes to you on Christmas morning. It would be nice if I could be there with him to help him. I'm still savoring your visit. I've not been as happy for I don't know since when as when, as when you are here. You're wonderful and I I think I'll think about what I'd like for my birthday, besides yourself, I mean. Be good. Give me some news about you. And believe me, I-L-Y, or, or me, I-L-Y, to be mo I-L-Y, mostly your I-L-Y, or mostly yours, Lee, X, Johnny. So obviously here, I-L-Y, standing for I love you. Um, and um, you definitely could interpret these as love letters. They definitely have that vibe. Um, my take is that they weren't sexually involved just because of their um, strong Catholic beliefs, um, but you certainly could read it in a different way. But I don't think it actually matters that much for the purposes of uh, history of psychology. Um, here's a quote from one of their students. Um, they struck me as an old married couple when she saw them at the 1972 APA meeting in Hawaii. I don't know that that's a photograph from that, but it sure sure does look like that. Um, and so it works to analyze them as a couple. Um, and there is a history of um, analyzing uh, scientific couples. Um, so more than anyone else, he functioned as her intellectual community, uh, shaped her ideas, supported her emotionally. Um, you know, he was often praying for her, telling her not to get upset about things. And obviously this was really key for her given Bertel's um, rejection to have that. And it was so important to her, uh, that community that he brought, that actually when she retired, she bought a house in Mobile and so that she could be near him. And so after 20 years of visiting and writing letters, they were finally together. Um, and the photos seem to indicate that he hung out there a lot. I understand he mowed the lawn and gardened. And actually, when he got sick with cancer, she got special permission from the Jesuits to ha have him stay at her house and have her care for him. Um, and when she died, he was, he was heartbroken. Uh, when he died, I, I can't. To really understand how 
diff appreciate John Gasson. You have to understand the context, what were women facing at the time. So this slide shows um, a couple of screenshots from a hashtag that trended a couple years ago called thanks for typing, in which um, people on the internet basically looked at the uh, acknowledgement sections of a lot of academic work and noticed, oh my gosh, these academic wives were doing a huge amount of labor for their husbands. And it's nice that they thanked him, thanked them, but maybe they should have been co-authors. Like actually, this is a ridiculous amount of work. Um, and unlike this um, sort of pattern of kind of taking advantage of um, your significant other, John Gasson really models this um, really different spirit. Um, Here's a quote about their writing that they wrote, something they wrote together. I could not distinguish the parts you wrote and my parts. Dear, dear, you and me belong so much together. And um, at one point they actually had a discussion about whether he should be a co-author on a particular piece because she felt like he had contributed a lot. And he basically disagreed, said, you know, uh, you know, well, I gave you some hints, but, um, you know, the way you're going to say it, it's going to be all your own. And of course, and saying that you really are wonderful. And I'll expand on this theme when we see each other on March 18th. And now, Gasson wasn't the only intellectual community she had. Um, there were also some Catholic psychology organizations. Um, and they would have annual meetings um, and you know, discuss ideas, take communion together. And um, yeah, I, th I think this is a good example of how important um, intellectual community is, especially when you have controversial ideas like these, or like Meg does. Um, and uh, John is the one that really urges her to, um, to start her, what ends up being her magnum opus of emotion. You know, she says, I know you don't feel like you're quite ready yet, but I think you should start. Um, and uh, yeah, in general, that Catholic community and Gasson really helps encourage her to keep uh, doing uh, things. So here's a account of uh, how they toasted the book when it came out at his little Catholic uh, college. And there's a whole bunch of other stories that he has about you know how much everybody's loving it and um, thinks it's just hot stuff. This all takes place against this backdrop of an academic discipline that was overwhelmingly male, both conducted by male psychologists, but using often all male subjects, and um, choosing the problems of psychology that needed sol solving based on sort of the a sort of stereotypically male interests. And what I hadn't realized until I wrote the paper on power was just how male some of the spaces that she entered were. So for example, Harvard. Um, and that's often because she wanted to kind of de-emphasize her identity as a woman and stress her identity as a, a scientist. Um, and this isn't something that's just limited to psychology. Um, this book by Carolyn Merchant, The Death of Nature, talks about how Nature has historically been conceived of as a veiled woman. And male scientists uh, are, in trying to discover things, are attempting to lift her veil, or sometimes her skirts, um, to uncover her secrets. And sometimes, as with Francis Bacon, an early scientist, the metaphor uh, is actually explicitly sexually violent, um, that nature has to be dominated in order to be understood. Within psychology, um, there's, this has affected the way the field is organized. So um, we kind of have this, a series of binaries located on opposite sides of a spectrum. So um, science being hard, objective, experimental, and high status versus on the other hand, essentially all the opposites of that. And of course, masculine and feminine is how those kind of things go. Um, and basically, the uh, women in psychology have been relegated to feminine areas despite any sort of interests. Um, the men, uh, these sort of all-male societies, uh, 
end up kind of keeping the women out. Uh, this group had a rule that explicitly banned women. Um, and there was actually, yeah, even women who would write, say, hey, I want to present a paper in your society. They were like, nope. And then coming back to the story at the beginning of that, um, uh, this psychological rounds table, another all-male society, um, there wasn't a rule against women members, uh, but the women just were never invited. And you don't really have to have a rule against it if you make it a really hostile environment for women uh, with showing porn at your uh, supposedly academic uh, gathering. Um, and so these men uh, go on to be uh, the major figures in psychology. Women are excluded from their intellectual communities, also Jewish and black men. Um, and so that gross penis gavel is kind of the perfect symbol of the power wielded by these men in order to rule, uh, order and rule psychology. So um, I think I'm gonna actually just skip over these next slides just for the sake of time, even though they're very interesting. Um, so maybe I can come back to them in the Q&A Q &A if, uh, if you are interested. So anyway, in summary, it is really this community, uh, this supportive intellectual community that allows Meg Arnold to kind of overcome uh, this, these barriers. They give her awards, they hold receptions in her honor, and of course, uh, they tell her she has great ideas that the world needed. So, thank you. All right, so we have a bit of time for Q&A, um, and I'm just gonna call on people myself. Um, so I will repeat your questions so that, because uh, we're recording. Um, but yeah, questions. Yeah. How was it that Magdalene and John initially met? I didn't catch Oh yeah, so she, he was, she was teaching a summer school uh, class at Harvard, and he was kind of doing continuing education for his work, and so that's, that's how they met. Um, yeah, so she was like uh, upset that he hadn't come and talked to her after class, because was, she was like, he's really smart, um, so. Yeah, good question. Other questions? Uh, yeah, in the back there. Um, just as a picture, when her like, oldest daughter graduated, mm -hmm. I'm curious, like, why would she wear her grad gown instead of the captain's gown? She graduated the same So, um, no, that would just be like for um, the faculty. OK, so the question was about why Magda's wearing a graduation uh, gown in the image with her and her daughter. Um, that would just be part of, because she was on faculty at that university, she would have been wearing that for the graduation ceremony. So that's why they have kind of matching uh, grad robes. Good question. Sam, yeah. So if I was 42 when she graduated from U of T, does that sound right? I believe so, yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about the, the large environment. Well, were, were women really rare at the U of T in general, or was it specifically psychology that made it uh, such a hostile environment? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so often, uh, so this is about U of T environment for women. Um, so often in history of psychology, um, we tell the American story of psychology and then throw in what uh, happened in Canada um, and be like, it's, it's the same thing. It is actually um, a little bit of a difference. So it was, um, there were actually a lot more women in uh, psychology at U of T, um, in part bec maybe because it got a bit of a later start. So it wasn't part of the um, generation of people who are like really excluding um, uh, women from coming into university. And so it actually was a pretty good place to be a woman in psychology. So she didn't actually have um, as many like career barriers there as a lot of women in other sort of universities experienced. Um, and yeah, she, yeah, uh, in general, she thought it was like really great. They kind of, I think actually, um, the U of T sort of version of psychology is a little bit more like Magda Arnold's uh, version of psychology. So it's a little bit not the typical uh, super behaviorist, super experimental kind of thing. So there was a bit more space for these different types of ideas. Okay, um, yeah, in the back. 
Oh, yeah. Um, so the question is, did her faith fuel her feminist views? Is that right? Um, so I don't know that she would have called herself a feminist. Um, I'm giving a feminist reading of her life. Um, she did mention occasions where she thought, you know, it was really annoying that she had trouble because of her life. But often women in this generation just don't identify as feminists because of wanting to kind of, yeah, be taken seriously as scientists without kind of, you know, being perceived to play this woman card. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't, like, I would say that her faith made her a little bit more on the conservative side of things. So it definitely maybe even pushed her away from feminism, which obviously isn't the way I would see it, but I think it was the way that she kind of um, saw the two relating. It's a really good question. Uh, other questions? Uh, yeah. Um, I, can you remind me what part of the talk that was, um, that would have been in? We were talking about, um, like her intellectual. Oh, intellectual community. Yeah. yeah. So she wasn't in any official community. So it's just more that this was, uh, off, the Catholic context was offering a lot of like supportive intellectual environment for her. That's also a good question. Uh, were Catholics uh, in general supportive of women? There was definitely, um, uh, it could go either way, I guess. There was, um, in, in this period, like the pre-Vatican II era of Catholicism where you have all these people still, like women dressed up in, um, you know, robes and the, the nuns and stuff like that. There was some um, empowerment of women with having that kind of vocation. Um, and uh, yeah, it, I don't know of any stories where she felt like really uh, shushed by Catholic uh, teaching, but I do know that of course there was, uh, they did have sort of more conservative teaching on women. So like that element was definitely there. Um, so I think what's one of the things that's really interesting, um, they talk a lot about um, Mary and their relationship with Mary, um, John and, and Meg did do. And so I think it's kind of interesting to think about how having that female figure might have affected her um, experience of her faith and feeling connected, you know, feeling empowered. Um, so I, but it's more speculation. I don't really have clear answers. Um, yeah. Um, you know, there wasn't a ton of that. Um, I, I wrestled a lot in my dissertation with like, what kind of conversion, how should I describe this conversion? Um, because, uh, she, uh, already was Catholic and then wasn't Catholic and then was attending a Protestant church at certain points in Toronto. So like what, what elements of it was conversion, but that, that sort of account of it is really kind of the best uh, thing that I have. Um, I do, yeah, I know that she found it really healing for a lot of her kind of personal hurts, uh, having that conversion experience. Um, and obviously, you know, really was quite willing to um, go out on quite a limb to, uh, yeah, to put her faith out there. Uh, yeah, good question. Um, could you say anything about, you know, suggestions for finding your intellectual community? Mm. And um, with Magda and uh, Father Gasson, when do you think they, when do you think they knew that this was mm. sort of not the not the not any other kind of relationship? But when when did it really? Do you think it was that it was sort of this is. Intellectual community. Yeah. Yeah. So advice on, on finding your intellectual community and when did John and Meg just start to see each other that way? Um, I think, um, you know, the cool thing about intellectual community, especially unofficial intellectual community, is it doesn't really have to be this formal thing, right? You can just realize, hey, I have these friends and we love to discuss ideas and kind of be a bit more intentional about it. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, there's there's been... 
various groups throughout history where they've like gotten together to kind of read each other's work, um, you know, if, if they're writing short stories or something like that. So you can just, you can kind of lean into those circles that you already have. Um, uh, in terms of John and Magda, um, their, their relationship is definitely intellectual, intellectually based right from the get go. They're like, he's being like, Hey, this book made me think of you. Um, and so I'm sending it to you. Um, and so there's this intellectual back and forth. They kind of bond in at Harvard. Um, they, the, when they finally have a conversation, they kind of bond over the same way that they see psychology. Um, so there's definitely this initial, you know, very, from very the very beginning, it's intellectual, um, but I would say it becomes less formal over time. So they start off calling each other Dr. Arnold and, you know, Father Gasson, and then eventually, as you can see, uh, they have all these pet names for each other, and, um, you know, it's communicating much more uh, closeness and really... Um, you know, they're, they're kind of bearing each other's burdens. They really know each other very well. There's a lot of stuff about John Gasson's health problems in his letters to her. And, um, you know, she's setting him med <laughs> sending him medicines that she thinks will help, that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. This is more on the art side. Like, mm. How does her work get into the archives? And, like, are all psychologists' work just put in? And, like, what is selected? Right. So, um, yeah, so you kind of have to be a bit famous to for an archive to want your papers. And then also somebody has to win you die or you have to do it ahead of time, kind of ship your papers off to them. So at retirement often is when that happens. Um, but uh, for women in the history of psychology, there's often a problem with um, the uh, <laughs> people thinking they're important enough to preserve their records and with them having had um, a uh, place to store papers during their career. So another female psychologist that I studied, um, Eleanor Gibson, she's married to, she's another one of these couples. She's, she's married to a famous psychologist and she herself was a famous psychologist and they both have archival collections at Cornell. And I went to go look at hers and it's kind of pretty piddly, especially compared to his. And the, the reason uh, is, although she was plenty famous by the time she retired, uh, she hadn't, she, there were 16 years where she was uh, kind of floating and didn't have a paid academic position. So she didn't have an office where she could store her papers. So they're just, you know, they're just gone. So a lot of the stuff that I was actually interested in for her career was, was earlier. Um, so yeah, it does take people kind of intentionally storing or um, storing things, and basically, an archivist will process the collection, kind of go through it, see if there's like stuff to be that's important enough to be kept. Um, but it really varies how much pruning there is. I've been to uh, uh, Gordon Alport, uh, who uh, one of the letters was written to, um, uh, who was a buddy of Meg De Arnold's. Um, I went to his archive and it's just, he just never threw away a piece of paper, right? It's just boxes and boxes and boxes and they're just the most mundane thing. Like high school student who wrote to him asking for career advice about psychology. He like, he kept the letter and he kept his reply and it's, it's great if you're wanting to do a history of him, but it does present quite a challenge sometimes for doing uh, the histories of women in psychology or other marginalized groups. Um, I have a friend who's doing the history of uh, sort of racism in psychology, and it's really a challenge to try to reconstruct the history of black psychologists, because again, they, they didn't have places to store stuff. So I was very fortunate to have so much rich material shared with me by, by Joan Arnold and, and others. Um, that's definitely not the norm for, for women in the history of psychology. Other questions? Yeah, go ahead, <laughs> follow up. Um, so last semester you had us do a paper on Magda and, um, and her, what her take would be on the Pixar movie Upside Down. And so didn't get your opinion on it, but I would like to know what, <laughs> if you did extensive research on her, what would, what would her think her opinion be on the movie? Yeah, okay, so the question was about the, the paper assignment for intro psychology um, where I asked students to tell me what Meg to Arnold would have thought of the movie Inside Out, which is about um, emotions. 
And basically, I think she would hate it. Um, <laughs> she had very strong opinions in general, and uh, you know, she didn't like that idea of basic emotions, of there would just be like a couple that are more important. She thought that emotions have much more to do with um, what are you drawn towards and what are you like um, repelled by. Um, and that doesn't really come up in the uh, pic in the Pixar movie at all. So I mean, you know, maybe she'd give it a little, cut it a little slack because it's a children's movie. But in general, if she were like analyzing it as a professional, she'd be like steam coming out of her ears. Um, pretty sure. Yeah. I just have a question about um, as a historian, when you're looking this deeply into an individual, how do you uh, keep a critical distance while at the same mm. time feeling like you're becoming a friend? Of the person. Right. And it's, it's obvious from your talk that you did do that, uh, but did you find, find the uh, Yeah, it's a really good question. So the question about critical distance from your subject. Um, yeah, I did find it a challenge um, in, in large part because I agree with her on a lot of the faith learning integration stuff. And in some ways she's saying a lot of things that, like really well that I, uh, believe, and so, she, and I find her. I also like really love how gutsy she is, right? Like she just like absolutely will just do something, even if it's going to be harmful for, to her career, just because she thinks it's the right thing. Um, but uh, I guess two answers to the question. One is um, I do know that like her decision to pursue a career and to leave her kids to their father was actually super da damaging to those children and to those children's kids. So, um, you know, and, and she had a lot of affection for Gasson. She didn't have as much for her own children. Um, so th I, that's where I start to kind of feel like, come on, <laughs> like, I don't know if you're choosing right here. Um, the other thing is that, um, you know, I guess uh, on a personal level, uh, as I've uh, watched uh, American politics um, recently and sort of um, watched uh, evangelicalism morph uh, and change and become more uh, right wing political, um, you know, I've kind of. I've also gained a bit of critical distance because I feel like, you know, I feel like she probably would have gotten sucked into that kind of thing too. Um, that is to say, like, um, sort of selling out your principles and supporting Trump. Um, and also, yeah, I also just have some more questions about that sort of integration project and uh, especially the integration project that I was taught, which was pretty apolitical. And now I realize actually I think that was a mistake, that um, there should have been some political formation that was going on as well as talking about how to faith and learning in, uh, go together. So anyway, it's a little complicated uh, answer there, but there you go. Yeah. Any last questions? Oh yeah, go ahead. So, um, so I guess she lived a very atypical life uh, for a woman in her time. Mm -hmm. um, so as she was kind of reintegrating back into the Catholic Church, was there ever any pushback uh, for her lifestyle? Or because it, it seemed to be quite supportive. Like, was that difficult for divine? Supportive. That would support her in her. Like being a divorced woman. Yeah, being yeah. a divorced woman and like being a teacher and, and psychology and things like that. Like, was that? Yeah, um, I don't know of any stories where uh, she she really found that. Uh, I guess the, the main story I can f say is that like she uh, felt like saw at some of the Catholic colleges that she was teaching at, she felt like the pay decisions were made differently for married men versus for her as a single woman, um, like that she didn't need as, uh, to be as well compensated. Um, but other than that, I don't have any stories of her kind of struggling to reintegrate. Um, it's mostly just very positive that she really loved the, the Catholic community. Um, I guess she does go on to be more critical of Catholicism once she's taught at that at Barra College where it's kind of like not very high quality education and she really disagrees with the idea that um, uh, yeah, that that's okay to just kind of have the second rate education. But that's not specifically about being a woman, um, but that's kind of where I saw the most most conflict there. But 
Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That emotional relationship benefited her work in a positive way, like having your intellectual, like having your relationship mm -hmm. with your intellectual community is a positive. Oh, okay. So sort of like just talking about how like close they were yeah. adding to that. I mean, yeah, it definitely. Uh, so does the their emotional closeness like add to their intellectual community? I mean, in this case, I think it did because they're there's this level of, of intimacy that made it sharing ideas really easy and um, you know, being open to criticism uh, from somebody that you know really cares about you is a lot easier than someone that you're you know, feeling, uh, I don't know, insecure about how they feel about you. Yeah, it is certainly, it's definitely not a requirement for intellectual community, but it is a sort of interesting twist uh, there. Yeah, good, good question. Oh, yep. Um, as a divorced woman, would she have been able to take communion in the Catholic Church? I mean, was she actually divorced? Because if she hadn't divorced, mm -hmm. I guess she could have. Right. So uh, the issue, so the question was about could she take communion as a divorced woman? Um, the issue would be more if she wanted to remarry, then she would run into problems. Um, she wasn't divorced for a long period of her, her life. She did eventually get a divorce when it became a little easier to get a, a divorce. Um, but yeah, I didn't ever find anything about her um, not being welcomed back into the church as a divorced woman, especially since, you know, essentially it was abandonment on, on uh, his part, right? She didn't, she didn't leave him. He left her, essentially. Because she wouldn't have been. Right, right. Yeah. So, you know, there's kind of barriers. If she and John, you know, had actually wanted to get together, he would have had to leave the Jesuit order and she would have had to not care about what the Catholic Church said about them getting remarried. So, yeah, there would be kind of barriers both both ways. All right. I think I think we're good for time. So uh, thanks so much. And I'll be up front. And if you have questions, I'm glad to talk to you about it more. Thanks.